um, thank you for coming. And uh, I, I'm Bob Armstrong, the director of the Energy Initiative. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us this afternoon uh, Brian Anderson. Uh, I should say welcome back to Brian Anderson. He's a graduate of, of MIT, he got his PhD in chemical engineering uh, here. I think took took a class in this room, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but probably not those same equations. Um, Brian is currently the director of the National Energy Technology Lab. Um, he, he is, which is one of the 17 DOE national labs, and by a considerable margin, the youngest director of, of one of the national labs. Um, he's a recipient of the 2012 uh, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, in 2011, uh, DOE recognized him with an Honor Achievement Award for his role uh, with a team uh, put together to, to help deal with the uh, deep, uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster. Um, he was a professor at the University of, of West Virginia before taking uh, this current job, and as I mentioned earlier, got his PhD uh, in chemical engineering uh, here. While he was, uh, or just about the time he finished, he was uh, part of the study team uh, for the future, one of our future of studies, future of geothermal uh, technology. And so that interest in subsurfaces has carried over. Uh, Brian, pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, Bob, I, I really want to thank you for, well, first, inviting me to come. Originally, it was going to be, I think, last September. Uh, and then uh, scheduling a, a, of events, some things came up, and I wasn't able to come in September. Uh, instead, uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, today, and, and I, can, I added some things to my talk from what I would have said in September, um, because it is an ever-evolving uh, landscape of technology and, and, uh, and, and policy, particularly around reducing uh, the cost of, of carbon reduction and reducing uh, the uh, the carbon footprint of uh, the fossil energy space. And as Bob mentioned, I'm the director of the National Energy Technology Laboratory. Of the 17 labs, we're the one laboratory that is uh, focused primarily on fossil energy technologies. And, uh, and so for us, uh, it is absolutely inherent uh, for the development of the technologies that are within our portfolio uh, to help uh, to help solve the climate crisis that we have uh, facing us as a globe today. And so uh, Bob did still a little bit of my thunder that uh, NETL is one of the 17 national labs. If you're not familiar with the Department of Energy National Laboratory System, uh, the 17 labs are comprised of 10 in the Office of Science, uh, three that are applied, uh, applied laboratories in different applied energy offices, one uh, us, NETL in, in the area of fossil energy, Idaho National Laboratory in the area of nuclear energy, energy and uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, focused on uh, renewable energy. Uh, there are three other labs uh, that uh, um, uh, steward our, our national nuclear stockpile uh, and one in the environmental management space. And, and the 17 national labs make up one of, if, if you put us as one organization, which we do have uh, sinews and connective tissue between all of the laboratories, if you put us in one bucket, we are effectively the largest scientific organization in the world uh, with user facilities uh, that, are, that are worth billions of dollars with annually billions of dollars of investment across the national lab system. And so for academic partners, uh, we cannot move forward the science that we need to move forward uh, for the Department of Energy, for the, for the nation without robust academic partnerships. And MIT is a partner in, in, with many of the national labs and individual faculty members I know collaborate with uh, national lab uh, counterparts uh, at an individual level or even at a larger uh, collaborative level. Of these 17 national labs, uh, we are the only one that is government owned and government operated and so some of the discussion about what we work on within the lab is different uh, than, than the other laboratories. And so what it means for us to be government owned and government operated is I'm a federal employee where all the other national labs, the employees, uh, they're all employees of, of an operating contractor and a management and operations contract. Now again, what that means is we have a little bit of a different role uh, in stewarding and developing technologies than the other laboratories. 
So our mission at NETL is to discover, integrate, and mature technology solutions, uh, and I'm going to shorten it, to save the planet. And, and so, uh, you know, I'd borrow this phrase from uh, one of my National Lab counterparts, and Martin Keller is the director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We have a planet to save, and we need to bring technology solutions to bear uh, in order to do that. And so that mission of NETL, and, and I do apologize for a deeper dive into what we are as an organization instead of the technology, because it is important uh, to understand how you can partner with us. And, and so one of the primary reasons for me being excited about MIT is not just because uh, I did my PhD in Building 66 and I get to walk down Ames, Ames Street, uh, but also because I want to develop more robust partnerships across uh, academia and certainly MIT uh, has a lot of talent to bring to bear to the challenges that we're trying to tackle. And so when it comes to discovering, integrating, and maturing technologies, we have very specific areas in each of those, each of those verbs. For discovery, we, we perform discovery science inside the laboratory with our researchers, both federal and contractor and academic uh, researcher staff uh, at the laboratory. But then the integrate piece is, is really key to trying to tackle large-scale problems. We manage, and oper manage about 900 different research projects across all 50 states with 600 project partners and a total award value today of about six and a half billion dollars is the, the amount of research that, that we're performing or managing at NETL. Now it's really important to understand to take technologies that are being developed in a project at, at, uh, u at one university, say at MIT, understand how that technology can integrate in a large scale energy system with a technology being developed at, at a company, say General Electric, and how we can take those two technology pathways, integrate them together into what the future energy system is going to look like. And so one of the big efforts we have at the laboratory right now is understanding that we have a goal in the future of what the energy system is going to look like, but how do we get there? And so one of our major efforts at NETL is understanding the pathway from getting where our energy system is today to the energy system of tomorrow that is decarbonized, reliable, uh, and low cost uh, for the economy of, of the United States. So to give a little history of NETL, uh, to, um, so you understand our mindset, uh, in the early 1900s, we had a spate of uh, mine disasters and explosions in the United States and underground mining. And so Congress uh, in, in uh, 1909 uh, declared that we should have a research center focused on decreasing mining deaths. I mean, we're talking about thousands of mining deaths due to explosions in, in one decade. And so our first uh, laboratory site was developed in, in Pittsburgh in 1910. We still have the experimental mines that are about uh, 500 yards from my office uh, that were built in 1910 to, to try to tackle some of those, some of those uh, explosion problems. And in fact, uh, the mining deaths did, did start to decrease due to some of the research that was going on. Fast forwarding into the World War II era, I know I'm skipping over the Bartlettsville, Bartlettsville Experimental Station in 1918, but if we go into the middle of the Second World War, in 1943, we opened the Albany Research Laboratory to develop new materials, uh, mainly for submarines for our, for our Navy. And that laboratory still exists today and has spun out uh, an entire ecosystem of advanced materials and alloy development in that portion of, of West Central Oregon uh, that uh, has now uh, blossomed into a research facility with tremendous expertise in alloy development uh, all the way from uh, in silico design of, of alloys through uh, fabrication, alloying, and, and even casting anneal and annealing. And in 1946, after the Second World War, uh, the U.S. decided we needed an experimental station to, uh, to work on synthetic fuels uh, after learning about the Fischer-Tropsch process and how to scale that up uh, in the United States, and thus was born our uh, synthesis uh, uh, synthetic Fuels Laboratory, uh, hosted at West Virginia University for the first few years, and then moving to its own site. And then as you move forward now another 75 years, we all combined into one laboratory that is uh, NETL that I was describing. I've already uh, given you a little precursor to uh, some of these numbers here, these three laboratories that we have in Albany, Oregon, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, and Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, we have a workforce of full-time uh, full employees of about 1,200. Uh, and then when I go back to We Are Go Go, this again explains some context of the rest of the talk. 
uh, that not only do we perform research, but we also manage a, a large portfolio of research for the department uh, as a whole, being federal employees. So we, we issue FOAs uh, that the faculty members and, and those writing proposals in the industry are familiar with the funding opportunity announcements that we put out on the street. Uh, you know, one pretty significant one, a $64 million one last, uh, last week on, on components of, of uh, the future of, of uh, power generation. Uh, but we also do, uh, do our own research. And the focus by site, I've, I've uh, again also previewed a little bit, particularly with Albany, but in Morgantown, uh, we have a lot of pilot scale work, scale up uh, energy systems uh, design, uh, turbine work, uh, and advanced combustion, as well as the geosciences in Morgantown and in Pittsburgh, uh, functional materials like catalysts, uh, conversion uh, materials, as well as uh, decision science, which uh, includes everything from life cycle assessment through technical economic assessment. So that's us in a, in a snapshot, uh, but this slide happens to be NETL all on one slide. Uh, we have core competencies within our research groups uh, in computational science and engineering, and uh, in fact, one, our computational fluid dynamics group is, is uh, arguably one of the best in the country, and our software, which is open source and, and free because we are go-go, uh, government-owned, government-operated laboratory, uh, called MFIX, uh, which is a multi-phase fluid flow, uh, computational fluid dynamic software that's free, uh, free for use, and I know there are users here at MIT, uh, is, is developed in our computational science and engineering group. Uh, we also do a lot of work in materials engineering and manufacturing, as I've also uh, touched on already. The geosciences uh, and geological and environmental engineering, basically anything in the subsurface, uh, energy conversion engineering, from the design of a turbine, the design of a turbine blade, all the way through uh, gasification and the next generation of uh, energy conversion technologies. Uh, systems engineering and analysis uh, is that decision analysis that I mentioned in techno-economic and life cycle assessment. And then in project management and execution, that's the group that its job is to integrate. We have discover, integrate, and mature technologies. The integrate uh, is, uh, falls in the hands of very uh, capable uh, technology managers. So we apply these not just to fossil energy. These core competencies, as you know, and faculty are very adept at doing. If you're a good geoscientist, uh, you can apply your skills in geothermal and, and CO2 sequestration, oil and gas recovery, uh, or nuclear waste uh, storage, or even seismic uh, prediction. And so we do the same. And uh, in the coal space, there's, there's efforts in advanced energy systems and carbon utilization, uh, and the others that you, you can see here. And oil and gas, everything from gas hydrates, which was what my thesis was on here at MIT, uh, was in, in gas hydrates. Uh, and I actually have a, a thesis committee member sitting here in the audience as well. Uh, and, uh, and we work in natural gas infrastructure and, and unconventional uh, recovery. But here's the surprising thing. The Fossil Energy Laboratory manages uh, a large portion of, of programs within energy efficiency and renewable energy. You can see in vehicles and buildings, geothermal and advanced manufacturing. Uh, we also manage the bulk of the research program in the Office of Electricity for grid reliability, uh, as well as new components that go onto the grid. And then finally, in cybersecurity, energy security, and emergency response. And so you see, yes, we might be the fossil laboratory, but our focus is really on the energy system as a whole and how we can move that energy system forward. And to give you a highlight on the budget, this is the FY 2020 budget, not the President's budget request. Uh, that came out last week for, for FY21. Uh, and these are the programs, again, that we support in EERE. Uh, coal, you can see, is still the largest portion of, of our budget. Uh, oil, gas, uh, Office of Electricity, and cybersecurity. And so uh, the one message I wanted to get across is, is that we are not only the Fossil Energy Laboratory. Yes, we are the Fossil Energy Laboratory, uh, but we are applying the, the expertise we have across uh, a number of energy sectors. And then EERE, CSER, and, and, uh, and so CSER is the Cybersecurity, Energy Security, Emergency Response, uh, and the Office of Electricity. Again, you can see that these are uh, thrust areas uh, and focusing on electricity. It's in advan the advancement of the grid, how we create the grid of the future, uh, and transmission and uh, transmission permitting, and then cybersecurity for all energy systems and ensuring that uh, our energy systems are, are secure. So one example that I wanted to uh, talk about is how we 
uh, are applying the skills. This is internal research at NETL, and I, I will give caveats about internal and external. Our internal research at NETL, we've been working on advanced materials, particularly how we can engineer uh, um, uh, magnetic permeability materials for inductor cores. The inductor cores on electronic motors uh, or in uh, transformers, voltage, DC uh, to DC uh, voltage converters. Uh, and in fact, we've been able to, starting in the, in the computer and designing uh, um, uh, from predictive capabilities that we have on uh, the material properties, designing processes by which we can create new uh, nanostructured uh, metallic or metallic alloys where we can tune the magnetic permeability and the thermal permeability through the core to create more efficient uh, um, uh, magnetic cores. And in fact, we can create nanostructures by not only creating the alloys based on the chemistry, but then through processing and some, a process called strain annealing where uh, you're actually pulling on a ribbon uh, of um, uh, a ribbon of alloy, you can create the nanostructures that uh, based on the strain you apply and the temperature, we can tune uh, the core to have uh, much more uniform magnetic and, and thermal distribution. What all of this means is we can take a transformer now, this, this is technology that's being commercialized by Eaton currently. You can take the transformer core that uh, sometimes in a, on a city, uh, city block or a suburban block, you see something that's about a cubic meter uh, for the, the transformer, and we can make that, downsize that by a factor of four. Now, when we think of deployment of solar energy and the size and weight and expense of the DC to DC voltage transformation that has to happen at the back of a solar array, by decreasing the size by a factor of four uh, and increasing the efficiency, we make solar, uh, solar arrays more efficient and cheaper. Uh, and so again, the theme that I'm saying, we're not just uh, fossil energy. This particular uh, technology was a recipient of an R&D 100 award this past year and a Carnegie Science Award. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have a lot of effort uh, going into, into this. So now to really change the subject and, and talk big picture about uh, how uh, the direction of our energy system is going, if, uh, how many of you remember the bomb cyclone uh, of, of 2018? I mean, I bet you remember the cold if you, if you really do. And, and so uh, we did have a, a number of series, the polar vortex in 2013 the, and the bomb cyclone in 2018 have put increasing strain on our energy system, particularly because we're right in the midst of a transformation of the energy system, particularly here in, in the Northeast uh, and into the Midwest from coal to natural gas and increasing renewables onto that grid. And, and the number of coal and nuclear retirements that are planned over the next few years will continue uh, to change the way that we generate electricity in the, in the, um, in the face of a changing climate and, and more intense uh, weather. Although I'd say 50 degrees this morning felt pretty good here in Boston. So if we look at the retiring uh, coal and nuclear units uh, that were operating during 2018 but are planned to retire uh, in the near future, and I know this is certainly an eye chart. I, I'll make sure that the uh, energy initiative, they have these slides and they'll be available. These are all publicly available. Uh, but this uh, particular uh, uh, information comes from a report that is set to be released tomorrow. So you're getting the advanced preview. Uh, it'll be released tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, so look for that uh, on the NETL website and, and DOE casts. Uh, but the planned retirements across, across the uh, energy system uh, and this is uh, specifically in uh, the uh, New England, uh, North, uh, New York, PJM, ISOs, uh, a significant number of coal retirements were deployed during the bomb cyclone. Now what this truly means is that we had to have more electricity on the system. Uh, the um, contributing renewables actually uh, during this particular bomb cyclone off of a baseline equivalent day uh, the wind had died down, and some of the wind uh, turbines were, were actually uh, not deployed because of the temperatures. And so we needed to increase uh, production of electricity during this time to keep the lights on and keep the heat on uh, for tens of millions, or arguably 100 million people uh, in the United States. And so what kicked on was coal and 
oil and dual fuel units, uh, that's pretty unfortunate, and natural gas were units that kicked on at lower, much lower efficiency, much higher CO2 footprint, uh, but also if we consider how much of this coal incremental generation that kicked on will be retired within the next year or so, uh, we see tremendous constraints on our demand system. Now, take it a step further, in these natural gas units that were further deployed, these are not the, the NGCCs, the, the natural gas combined cycles that are operating at 60 plus uh, thermal efficiency. Uh, these are mostly gas turbines that are operating more at the 40% efficiency. Uh, these are kicking on at uh, uh, prices that are following uh, the demand cycle and the demand with natural gas does not follow uh, some single spot market price. The demand for natural gas is reliance on the infrastructure to get natural gas uh, to those plants. And so the response of the market, and if you're an economist, you say, well, the market works. Uh, and we saw extreme spikes in natural gas prices. And you look at New York ISO eight times the, the uh, baseline natural gas price uh, during the bomb cyclone meant the people who were heating their homes were paying more uh, for their electricity during that, during that extreme weather event. And in, in uh, New England, ISO, ISO New England uh, is a 4X on, on the um, price of natural gas. And we see subsequently uh, the increase in prices of electricity. Now this period of time, 2018, uh, the market worked. It could supply. We didn't have brownouts. We didn't have blackouts. Uh, but yet, if we go back to the coal slide, the incremental coal that, that will be will be retired, uh, was supplying a lot of electricity to ensure we have a reliable grid 365 days a year. If we now move to California and, uh, and the extreme, uh, extremely positive deployment of uh, intermittent renewables in California has led to shifts and changes uh, on the electricity grid within uh, um, California ISO. And if we look at uh, the incremental power uh, that is uh, needed throughout the day, uh, and these are um, uh, California fossil in yellow, non-California uh, uh, fossil in, in gray, which are the dots, harder to see, uh, imports, uh, which are, you know, uh, I think on, on the market, some of them come from Canada and, and other places, uh, in, including Nevada, and the net demand in, in blue, what we're really seeing is that the ramp rates necessary to overcome the sun going down uh, in, in the evening is, has kept increasing. Now what's happening is the aggregate fossil fleet response has moved up to 85 megawatts a minute necessary for the fossil energy response. Now the ramification of this is these are lower efficiency units. These are gas turbine units, not natural gas combined cycle units that are operating at high efficiency. And during ramping, uh, a natural gas turbine is not efficient. And so, in fact, we have reached the point in California uh, where there is um, marginally a decreased effect of in, a, a decreased effect of increased um, non-emitting renewables, such that we've actually started to make the turn where, if you run the what's called a life cycle assessment and understand how much CO2 we're putting out during the day, we're starting to run into dangers of increasing emissions because we're deploying more intermittent renewables because storage hasn't caught up. And so this is, I'm setting the stage for what research needs to be done. So certainly, number one, we need, to, we need deployable, grid scale, efficient, uh, long-term storage of electrons. That is hands down number one what we need for increased deployment of renewables in our, in our grid in the United States. We also, there's, there's you know, I'm, I'm an all of the above kind of guy. If we can develop a technology that's rampable with a low cost raw material that can capture a carbon and still be net carbon zero in the end, but use a lower price uh, technology, we'll let, let the market compete. And so in fact, one of the research areas that we're working on in the Office of Fossil Energy at NETL is how we can develop uh, a natural gas or a coal plant uh, that can intermingle with potentially biomass uh, and capture carbon and see if it can compete with the storage uh, combined with, uh, with intermittent renewables. Uh, because in fact, if we can solve that problem, 
we're going to tackle the bigger problem is, is fossil energy the enemy or is the CO2 that's emitted by burning fossil fuels the danger to the planet? In my, in my view, uh, it's the CO2 and the particulates and the NOx and the SOx uh, that are the danger to the planet, not necessarily the depletable uh, uh, resource. And also, when we think about how we get to an end goal, if we want to get, if we get to an end goal of developing the storage that uh, can deploy on the grid at the scale necessary for 100% deployment of, uh, of uh, carbon-free electricity, so be it. But in the pathway to get from here to there, we need solutions today. We need solutions on the market that are ready to go, that are scalable, that do not disrupt uh, the economies of the globe, as well as, uh, I, I guess I want everything. We need to be decarbonized and we need to not destroy the wealth that we have uh, on the planet. And so the challenge, when we think of the, uh, the deployment of, of energy in the United States, and so if we look at across all sectors, uh, primary energy that's used, we are still today using 80% fossil energy as a primary resource. And so the challenge is if that's what we're using today, it's going to take time for us to get from 80% to 0% or at least 0% uh, emitting fossil energy. It's gonna take time. It's gonna take a lot of time. So we need to find the solutions for the fossil energy sector today of how we can make, how we can make it clean. All of that, I know it sounds like a justification for me having a job, doesn't it? Um, but uh, another challenge I want us to think about, and I know that MIT is doing a great job of, of not overlooking the fact that, yes, we spend a lot of time discussing how we can decarbonize the power sector. Uh, we talk about low carbon electricity and wind and solar, but today the transportation sector is a larger emitter of CO2 than the power sector. And that is one that oftentimes in the public discourse is overlooked. And we, can, we cannot continue to overlook it. So if we look at some fossil energy priorities, it's how we can advance that uh, coal plant of the future that is flexible, uh, that uh, can, can ramp and be uh, net zero uh, or even net negative carbon. Uh, how we can modernize the existing fleet with carbon capture, uh, how we can reduce the cost of carbon capture utilization and storage, which I know is really the title of the talk, uh, how we can then expand the use of big data and data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and apply it to the energy sector as a whole. Uh, how we can address the energy water nexus, reducing our human footprint on the freshwater demand through our energy production. And then finally, uh, we have a real problem uh, with the, the current supply of rare earths and critical materials uh, that go into every battery uh, go into the permanent magnets of the wind, excuse me, <coughs> permanent magnets in, in our wind turbines uh, and in uh, our electric vehicles, and what are some opportunities to, to move that forward? So the evolving topics in this, in specifically to the coal space, so now I'm focusing in on reducing the carbon footprint of the power sector. We can advance the next generation of the coal plants and develop, an, well, I'll, I'll go in more specific in the next slide, but advance these small coal plants uh, that are uh, near or near zero or even negative emissions, upgrade the existing fleet, pioneer some markets for coal because if we put the uh, coal power business out of, or coal power sector out of business, well, we have a really good raw material that's a great source of carbon and there might be some opportunities there. Uh, and then finally, to reduce the cost of carbon capture, we're doing everything from advancing uh, computational simulation tools uh, to advanced manufacturing to try to lower that cost of carbon capture. And so the, the Small Modular Plants Initiative is, is titled Coal First, um, and it stands for Flexible, Innovative, Resilient, Small, and Transformative. I didn't, Department of Energy loves acronyms. I did not come up with this one. Uh, it sounds a little too political for me, to be, to be uh, frank. Um, but the design criteria is one that I think we can all get behind. How do we have a net zero uh, or net negative uh, um, carbon uh, carbon emitting uh, power production plant uh, that has variable sizes that can move into a distributed energy system, be it in the US or, or in developing countries, uh, that uh, has high ramp rates 
and can actually operate efficiently at low loads. Uh, these are all criteria of what we need in order to complement renewables on the grid. And in fact, and this sounds like heresy, but if we can achieve this, we can actually increase the amount of renewables we can deploy on a reliable grid. Because if we can have a, no, a low carbon, flexible, rampable uh, electricity generation system, and, and our target is low carbon, in fact, we can deploy this in concert with grid scale storage. And so this is in fact, you know, one of the ba major initiatives. It, it is actually the subject of that $64 million FOA I, I mentioned uh, earlier. So currently, uh, we have a number of uh, pre-feed, this front end engineering design for those non-engineers uh, in the room uh, on some of these co uh, um, concepts for, for the flexible, integrated, uh, re re resilient, um, small and transformative coal plant of the future. Uh, one, some that include supercritical carbon dioxide as the, as the working fluid, uh, some with gasification and poly generation, so that, you know, what else can you create from uh, gasified coal? Uh, advanced ultra supercritical, that's what AUSC stands for, uh, or ultra supercritical combined with a gas turbine. Uh, so these are ways you can piece together uh, new plants of the future, uh, pl pressurize uh, uh, oxy combustion and, and uh, using uh, a steam turbine. And so all of these then require that we lower the cost of, cost of carbon capture and, and sequestration. And so we have a number of areas uh, specifically in carbon use and reuse, enhanced oil recovery and, and geologic storage. So if we're starting down a pathway of, of deploying uh, CO2 sequestration technologies, that pathway as we've defined, uh, at least for our research efforts, are to take carbon capture and start moving toward uh, in 2025 integrating CCS projects. Uh, we are currently this year working on the R&D uh, for second generation capture technologies. In the storage space, how we can move into commercial scale storage complexes that are fully characterized uh, in three dimensions uh, for the permanence of CO2 storage. And then in 25, deploy these integrated carbon capture and sequestration projects. And then truly in 2035, this looks like a long way out there, but these are the uh, what we're targeting for the truly transformational technologies of removing and separating CO2 uh, from flue gas and having those deployed uh, in, in 2035. So some examples of second, second generation uh, technologies that have moved now to the pilot scale, a little pre-commercial, but have moved to the pilot scale and tested uh, at our facility, the National Carbon Capture Center in, in Wilsonville, Alabama. Uh, these, these technologies include uh, everything from new amine sorbents and solvents and membranes and, and uh, other types of solvent processes, uh, as well as some solid state uh, type uh, absorption systems. So moving beyond the monoethylamine MEA process that has been commercially deployed uh, at anywhere from 60 uh, to $50 uh, per ton of capture, trying to target uh, driving down the cost of this capture to uh, to 40 or even $30 per, per ton of CO2. And so I mentioned the National Carbon Capture Center has been going for 11 years, uh, and, and uh, they, we've invested about $360 million into this facility. It's a user facility with uh, lots of partners, uh, many of whom uh, do work directly here with, with MITE at, at MIT for testing and, and deploying and, and uh, um, piloting uh, new carbon capture technologies. Now, uh, the NCCC is now uh, capable of testing uh, carbon capture materials on natural gas, uh, flue gas. Now, the major difference between natural gas and, and coal is uh, coal flue gas is right around 14% uh, on average, 14% CO2, natural gas around seven uh, or so, uh, plus uh, some of the uh, constituents that come out uh, in, in the coal system, not in the, not in the natural gas system. So I did want to give a little highlight to some work going on here at MIT. Uh, uh, this is this, uh, I know just a single out one, but he wasn't here. Uh, Alan Hatton's group uh, and, and many others are working on carbon capture technologies. This is an NETL uh, funded project uh, on moving the pathway forward and cutting capture costs, uh, particularly on, on the recovery of the sorbent material and, and the release of the CO2, uh, targeting cutting the capture cost by 30 to 60%. 
uh, this particular work is really exciting and, and, uh, and, and novel, and there's some also I learned today about some other novel uh, technologies in uh, using electrochemistry to help assist in, in uh, the CO2 capture process and CO2 release. And so I really encourage any interested parties, uh, researchers here at MIT, my philosophy uh, with the National Lab is not uh, to grow what we do uh, within the National Laboratory. My philosophy is we have a problem to solve. And I want all the talent uh, that we have available uh, across the United States and across the world to join with us in trying to tackle this, ma this major uh, challenge of taking the 80% of the fossil energy that we have today and, and moving down the pathway of decarbonizing. And so one of the major efforts, and I know there's a lot of, a lot of work at MIT uh, and a lot of expertise is in computational science. And so uh, at, at NATL, 70% of, uh, um, of our publications in 2019 uh, included a component of computational science. And we do have uh, some uh, computational centers, uh, including our, our supercomputer, Joule, which is uh, the 21st fastest supercomputer in the United States all focused on uh, fossil energy research, and this is in Morgantown, and we're in the middle of building a data analytics and machine learning facility, which will inform some of the, the subsequent slides, uh, where we've completed phase one, we have 19 petabytes of storage and, and, uh, and 128 GPU units. If that doesn't mean a whole lot to you, the 19 petabytes of storage can store the Library of Congress 1,023 times, uh, and uh, our read-write uh, speed uh, on the data analytics machine is actually what's most impressive. Uh, we, in fact, can, if you, if you take data and you put it on uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, one inch margins, double-sided, cheap paper from, from Walmart, and stack it end to end, uh, the Library of Congress will go from Washington, D.C. to St. Louis, and we can read it at four miles a second. Uh, and what it, that really means is we're able to process a, a, one of the world's largest pipelines of data uh, simultaneously uh, while then trying to gain knowledge uh, from that data. And so we need, and this is a call to the NETL, I mean, to, to the MIT community to work with NETL, we need experts in algorithm development and artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and, and data analytics. Uh, we have a tremendous team and we're always looking for collaborators in this particular space. So how do we use uh, artificial intelligence, data analytics, and machine learning uh, to drive down the cost of carbon capture. So one particular example is we had uh, our, our in-house research group was examining different membrane materials of combinations of polymers and molecular organic frameworks that can selectively separate CO2 from flue gas. Well, in fact, if you look at the molecular organic framework materials that can selectively take CO2 and you look at the polymer, uh, polymer uh, um, backbone material, uh, there's a combination of about one billion different types of uh, composite materials. So we selected about a million of them, uh, screened them through high throughput uh, and uh, computational engineering, and selected four of the million uh, that looked very promising, four combinations of the million that looked very promising, and in fact, those four uh, we then synthesized in the laboratory, measured its uh, CO2 permanence, uh, permeance, and then in de subsequently decreased the cost of carbon capture using just that, that particular membrane uh, by from 63 to 48 dollars per ton. Pretty significant for the first cut. Now that computation of the million molecules took about four months on our supercomputer, the, 20, the 55th fastest supercomputer in the world, took about four months to do all of that. If you remembered, I said about a billion, we have 999 million more to go. I'll finish, I'll give you an answer in about 2065 if we don't apply artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data analytics to understanding the fundamental science of what was driving those four materials out of the million and, and have a physical understanding. And so we're bringing together data analytics uh, with subject matter experts of, of material science and chemistry to try to understand using big data sets uh, what is truly driving uh, physical science. Another specific area in computational science uh, is an alternative of what you do with CO2. So can we, if we are suddenly, I'll use the word blessed, with uh, the opportunity of uh, what would turn into the world's second largest uh, commodity of CO2 if we were truly to capture at the gigaton scale, uh, we would uh, then have a very low cost precursor with carbon on it uh, that might be useful for, uh, for conversion given the right uh, low energy 
uh, or low cost energy and, and uh, renewable energy uh, conversion techniques. And so uh, we've been able to predict uh, the decrease of uh, the, the cost of catalyst uh, first in silico uh, to uh, lower the energy barrel, I mean, using a catalyst, but decreasing the cost uh, and the amount of uh, precious metals uh, in the catalyst. So we've been able to cut the cost of that catalyst through computational science by about 50% by removing almost removing more than half of the gold uh, in the traditional nano catalyst. And I, I know I'm really flying now, but I, I'm watching the clock and I wanna give time for a two-way conversation both between uh, Bob Armstrong and me and, and you uh, and, and me as well. But an area that's really exciting to me is in uh, the opportunity of taking coal as a valuable material not to burn, but to convert into other uh, high value materials as a low cost energy commodity. And so we've been able to develop uh, a pathway from coal to graphene that in fact, if you buy graphene uh, by the liter today, graphene and aqueous solution by the liter today, a jar of about a liter costs uh, $25,000 or so. And we have developed a pathway to take it from coal using about a half a penny's worth of coal and four hours of technician time uh, to produce that uh, $25,000 bottle of, of aqueous graphene. Now certainly that is a game changer when we consider what we can use graphene for. And this is, this is not, it, 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 we can suddenly start to have graphene at volume that can do things like enhance the strength of cement, uh, that can enhance the, the, for roads and surfaces, it can enhance uh, um, other materials, such as one we're working with is a graphene foam for, uh, with Ford for the F-150 uh, that, that both lightweights and, and makes it stronger. And so when we think of uh, other areas of how we can use machine learning, we're doing everything from uh, systems level modeling, uh, process control, process optimization, optimization and modeling uh, through uh, process synthesis and, and intensification of how you can take a uh, chemical process and, and start to shrink it down and intensify the processes, making them more efficient, as well as materials discovery, and I've given a couple examples of those. So then finally, how do we use all of the tools that are becoming available now today for manufacturing uh, and applying those to decreasing the cost of, of carbon capture? And I'm, I'm actually showing uh, uh, some effort by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory done in, in collaboration with NATL. Uh, there's also work at Oak Ridge and Ion Engineering on how we can design the process unit uh, that uh, uh, contacts CO2 laden flue gas with uh, the amine or the sorbent, increasing the uh, uh, diffusion, increasing the mass transfer and controlling the heat transfer to again keep driving down the cost of carbon capture, not just from materials design, but process design. And there's tremendous potential uh, when we design from the computer, build additively, build using additive manufacturing, the process units uh, that would be used for, for carbon capture. And, and, and we think we can decrease costs again by another 20 or so percent, depending on your baseline. So then finally, what about carbon storage in the subsurface? This is one of the big uh, question marks around uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Is it permanently stored? Not 10 years, not 100 years, not 1,000 years, but tens of thousands of years. Is it permanently stored? And how do we understand what's going on the subsurface? So our approach is to put together some of the best minds we know at Pacific Northwest National Lab, Lawrence Livermore, Lawrence Berkeley, and Los Alamos, and create a, a, an organization called the National Risk Assessment Partnership to start to understand where the risks and how to mitigate those risks are for permanent CO2 sequestration. And so going back to this theme that you've probably noticed of machine learning, data analytics, and artificial intelligence, uh, we are building one of the world's largest cross-cutting databases for subsurface, uh, for subsurface engineering uh, that will exist in the public space. Again, going back to the fact that our computational fluid dynamic software is free, this database largely will be, uh, will be public or certainly the, the results uh, of how we can understand processes in the subsurface by building synthetic data sets through simulation and then uh, understanding risks and, and uncertainty uh, through artificial intelligence uh, is the pathway we're on. I've got two more slides and then we'll start a discussion. 
Because going back now all the way to the beginning, um, our mission at NETL is to discover, integrate, and mature technologies. If we develop technologies that never make it to market, then we have not done our job. We need technologies that get to market as fast as possible uh, to solve the challenges of, of the energy system today. And so one example, and this is a carbon capture example, we're partnered with Petronova uh, on what is the world's largest uh, CO2 capture and sequestration uh, project. Uh, we started on some proof of concept and, and uh, materials development in the early 90s, culminating uh, with the deployment of the project in 2016 uh, and the continuation of that uh, CO2 capture project on a coal burning power plant in, in Texas. Uh, and, and have demonstrated to the world that it can be done. It's mar marginally commercial in terms of its uh, commercial viability today, but this is technology that was developed and deployed 20 years ago. So when we start accelerating the development of technology, the deployment of those second generation carbon capture technologies that are pushing uh, the cost down to uh, targets of 40 and $30 per, uh, per metric ton captured, uh, the next iteration will be uh, even better. And so just to, you know, Bob gave me some, some news that I wasn't aware of because I've been tied up all day today, but uh, the Treasury Department has uh, started to uh, give guidance to the commercial sector on something called 45Q. It's a tax credit for uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, and, and there are a number of commercial projects that are waiting on the guidance uh, to start moving forward to continue to iterate and deploy commercial technologies in carbon capture and sequestration. And that's our goal. Our goal at NETL is to take technologies at the discovery level, move them through the uh, technology development gauntlet, and have those commercial technologies that are moving into scale, have technology confidence, will get investment, uh, and provide private sector cost share. And so that's where I am. Uh, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your attention and for coming today. I hope it was informative. Why don't we slide these in the front so yeah, absolutely. You see us. Can everybody see us here? Uh, so we're going to do so maybe 10 minutes of questions. I, I will, and then we'll open it up. Uh, there are instructions up here to send your, your questions in. So let me start to go back to um, some of the capture technologies you talked about uh, in the context of flue gas uh, capture and, and ask if, if you've looked at those in other industries. So obviously the power sector, coal combustion, natural gas, we, we need to get the CO2 emissions out of that. Other sectors like cement manufacturing, uh, steel manufacturing, um, we need to get the CO2 emissions out of those sectors too. So yeah. what, it, what, what's the versatility here? Well, Bob, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I mentioned the transportation sector, and that's about a third of our emissions. Um, the power sector is about a third. The other third is the commercial, residential, and industrial uh, space. And so in fact, uh, we have been doing some work in, in uh, capture from industrial sources. We have a couple pro projects there. Uh, there are different challenges. Um, sometimes the industrial source has higher concentration of CO2, uh, but smaller streams. And so one, one particular example that is great to look at is Arthur Daniels Midland project. This is an um, uh, ethanol refinery, e ethanol production facility in uh, Decatur, Illinois. And uh, we have a capture process there, a uh, capture project uh, capturing the, the CO2 from the fermentation and sequestering in a saline aquifer. It's a Mount Simon aquifer there in, in Decatur. And so that's one example of an industrial process. Uh, but then we, I didn't mention it in the, in the talk, but the, over this past year, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, the National Renewable Energy uh, Laboratory, and ExxonMobil entered into a 10-year, $100 million agreement specifically to try to develop scalable technologies and carbon capture uh, for the industrial sector, everything from refining to petrochem. And so we are really moving in that area very quickly. So you mentioned at the end of 45Q, um, the, the subsidy there, the tax credit, ranges up to $35 a ton for uh, EOR applications, 50 for sequestration. 
How close are we uh, to that? Is that going to get us over the, over the hump here for, for getting CO2 capture commercial? Well, the EOR one is, is actually, I think, it, it is sufficient for a lot of industry interest. Um, you know, the Petronova project does not have a 45Q uh, tax credit on it. And so when you consider um, the, when you consider that and a potential uh, price of, of oil, uh, I think there is a lot of incentive uh, to get into the process and refine it, optimize it, and, and start driving down the cost. So there's a lot of commercial interest at that $35 rate. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's actually the evidence. Now, uh, there's an investors, there's also a, a consortium that you know, I, I'm sure you're aware of and, and others may be, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, OGCI. A uh, number of uh, global oil and gas companies have put together fund, a fund that rate, it's on a billion dollars uh, to start pushing commercial technologies. They've had a number of investor forums here in the United States, uh, and they're looking to fund technologies to start pushing that forward. Uh, and a lot of the focus is in, in the EOR space. You mentioned uh, capability in, in imaging CO2 subsurface mm -hmm. and tracking it uh, where it goes uh, with time. I, is there some way you could, or do you think it's valuable to make that available to the public so that they could actually see? I'm not sure you want to watch real-time movement of, of CO2 subsurface, but maybe some, some uh, time tracking over... Uh, decades or however long you've been measuring uh, these data. So people have some sense of, do, do you actually know where the CO2 is? Do you have some assurance that, that uh, it will stay there for long periods of time? That's right. I, I think there would be broad interest all the way from you know, certainly the individual company that's liable for the CO2 that's in the subsurface, or in the case of North Dakota, the state that is liable for the CO2 in the subsurface, all the way to individual uh, individual citizens uh, who who would want to know uh, any potential danger or risk of where they live uh, if there's a CO2 plume 6,000 feet below uh, where they live, um, and then the other the other piece of that is the investment sector uh, because uh, when when you look at investment risk, you would have to consider the risk of CO2 leakage. Uh, if you are monetizing a tax credit or, or a, a carbon price. And so I think there would be broad interest in, in understanding that. Um, so, so to go back to an area that you touched early, your, your materials, advanced materials uh, capability, um, there's a lot of interest in that here to, because there are materials challenges for uh, energy and, and almost across the board. Um, what, one area of Intense interest at MIT now is hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And hydrogen presents its own interesting set of materials challenges. And I, I wonder if you could say something about materials work you do at, at uh, NETL yep. that, that is applicable to hydrogen. No, and I, certainly there, there's a lot. Hydrogen does present its own challenges um, because it's so small and can get anywhere. Um, but, uh, um, you know, one, one disservice I did to, uh, to the uh, materials development slide, uh, it was called extreme mat or X mat. Uh, that is a cross-cutting effort. That is not just fossil energy. That is uh, very specifically designed for any material for an extreme environment. And extreme environments range from pressure and temperature is what would come to mind at first, but also uh, the chemical composition. And so there, uh, we're considering everything from uh, nuclear materials and nuclear waste uh, through hydrogen and, uh, and, and other chemical components as well as temperature and pressure. But then when we think of the, the issues that face, would face us in large-scale deployment of a hydrogen economy, if, if you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people that remember that terminology from about 18 years ago, um, but if we really look at decarbonizing the transporta transportation sector, uh, again, let the market decide between batteries and solid oxide fuel, or you know, PEM fuel cells uh, powered by hydrogen. Uh, and so, if we look at the challenges that we would face in, in the trans, uh, transmission and distribution of, of hydrogen across the across the space, we need good pipeline materials that uh, that can withstand the test of time, as well as the uh, hydrogen. If we're concerned about 
you know, we are concerned about methane leakage from the existing pipelines. I mean, we've seen the, the study done here in the city of Boston, well, across the river in the city of Boston about pipeline leakage. Um, and, uh, and we think about uh, moving to a hydrogen infrastructure. We need to understand uh, what the, the risks are. Hydrogen will leak more than methane. That, that, that's a fact. Yeah. So with, with, with hydrogen, um, if you wanted, if, if you burn it, say, in a, in a combustor, if you repurpose uh, uh, gas turbines or uh, combined cycle plants to use hydrogen, you're there, not going to be able to use the same material. Right. There, there, there right? Some, have to be some retrofitting. Flame, flame uh, temperature, you'd have to redesign, you redesign uh, the nozzles and, and, and everything at the combustor tip. But there are hydrogen turbines that have been designed that are commercially rated uh, today. Uh, to, to go into the market to, to burn hydrogen. So let, let me ask a, a little bit about the, you, you talked about in the California system as, as you ramp up uh, intermittent renewables, the challenge for gas turbines uh, in particular, even see, uh, the combined cycle plants uh, are, are less efficient and, and they do, they are forced to ramp their you know, NGCC, N NGCC don't like, plans don't, don't, they don't ramp like any better but, than but coal. They, yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. But the question is, uh, ha have you looked in your systems analysis at, at um, hybridizing these GT plants with batteries? Yes. I know GE had a, a version of a, of a hybrid system. And what kind of role could those play in providing that more rapid ramping without uh, the increase in emissions? Uh, absolutely. And yeah. And so that's a matter, it's really back to the fundamentals of the way we need to rescale back. We, we need to bring battery storage to scale at cost. Um, and so if we can do that where you have batteries that can deploy at a ramp rate much higher than, than uh, any uh, existing fleet, then absolutely it can play a critical role. Um, you know, be it within, within a plant fence, uh, and this just really comes down to economic and market models, whether it's in the fence or it's outside the fence, but I think it still comes back down to uh, grid scale storage. So looking at your broad portfolio at, at NETL that you showed us, um, what, what's, what's the best lever you think you have for reducing CO2 emissions in our energy system? <laughs> um, this will be your last question, so you can go out and... and uh, so uh, when I look at the, when I look at a time horizon, I'm I am very optimistic about um, the next ten to fifteen years about the deployment of carbon capture and utilization and sequestration, um, and I think that is that is a lever uh, that uh, when we look at what you know, if we're looking at percentages and you look at a, a really big denominator. Uh, of 80% of our uh, energy sector uh, is fossil energy based. If we can develop a technology that can then start down, down the pathway, uh, down a learning curve by deploying over and over again, um, I think that there's a, a great potential to increase the decarbonization that we've, we have, the momentum we have in the US uh, and, and accelerate that through carbon capture and, and sequestration. I, I, I'm really optimistic about that. Good. Well, would you join me in thanking uh, Brian once again for a great talk? Thank you. Do we have any questions from the? We got. Yeah, we're good. Oh, I think. Did we done. take questions from the audience or? No. Oh. I got none. Uh, yeah. Did anybody in the audience send a question through no. the? Okay. Why don't you? I, I have none here, so. Huh? Well, let's just take it from the floor. How about that? Yeah. Uh, the question was, you, you mentioned that the, the technologies that you're looking at, most likely it would be uh, on the stream in 2030. And my question is, is that too late? Because I don't believe you even start capturing CO2 at that date. We already seem to be doing So the question, in, in case I'm for the for the webcast, in case I didn't hear you, um, is, two, is 2035 uh, the date that was mentioned about integrated next generation uh, carbon capture? Is that too late? Yes, it is. It, it is too late. Um, the, that particular uh, development is more like moving from uh, the flip phone to the smartphone. 
in my view. We still got cell phones out and deployed and all across the sector uh, that started with the brick, uh, the big brick, then the little brick, then the flip phone. And so I think within the next five and 10 years, we start, we start capturing at costs where 45Q is, is, is providing the lever for EOR. That happens in the next five, and ten, five to 10 years. Substantial construction under 45Q has to start uh, currently by 2024. Um, and so then the next generation is once we go beyond the, the low-hanging fruit where you have an EOR field that you can move to and we start doing permanent sequestration um, at a much, much larger scale uh, in sailing aquifers. Uh, and so I think that that pathway truly will start within the next five to 10 years um, before the 20. 25 date that I, well, I, at, the, at the 2025 date that I mentioned, and then we see the wide scale ball rolling into the 2035 where those are truly transformational technologies that drop the price, again, something that we at this point can't anticipate what the technology would be. So, so uh, another question from the audience, I finally got them here. <laughs> so, what does that say about transmission speed here? Uh, so besides carbon uh, capture and storage, is there any major project on re reutilization or transformation of the CO2 uh, that you capture? Yeah, there are, there are a number of, I, mean, I mentioned you know, one internal project on developing the catalyst to, to convert CO2 into uh, you know, either a hydrocarbon source or even, even if you take it to carbon monoxide, it's more reactive. Uh, and there's a whole portfolio of projects in how we can take CO2 and either chemically convert it uh, or use the CO2, I mean, not just in EOR, but, but other, other sorts of projects. And, and just as you and I talked earlier today, even uh, if we get the right financial structure, we suddenly turn from a, a space in EOR where you want to use the least amount of CO2 to recover the most amount of oil to where if the CO2 is actually valuable to sequester, then you want to use the most CO2 to recover the oil uh, and and uh, if you have the right uh, CO2 sequestration incentive structure. Um, so, so there's a question here about uh, biomass uh, combustion oh, yeah. with uh, carbon capture and storage for a negative emissions technology. Yeah, yeah and, and so the, the application of the carbon capture technology is perfectly applicable. I mean, take the, the ADM, Arthur Daniels Midland Project. Uh, and so if we can then uh, develop the, the right uh, technology for the conversion of biomass uh, to where it's it's at a good price point and you you have a carbon capture at a good price point yes that's a great scalable large scale uh, negative co2 emissions uh, technology good you use the use the biomass as your direct air capture right. process instead good so that's the set of questions I have um, one more here Okay. Net emission technologies, that is, you would put your flu stackings, source point source. We've got 450 parts per million. We're going blowing past the IPCC's targets, uh, heading towards 2C, maybe 6C, by the turn of the century. What about taking carbon directly out of the air? Yeah, so the question was what about direct air capture? You know, and, and when we look at uh, the in, the, the increment of the CO2 in, in parts per million that, that we're seeing on an annual basis, year over year. And, and that's why we do need negative, negative carbon, negative emissions technologies, uh, including direct air capture. We have a portfolio, we have three projects right now in direct air capture. Uh, carbon engineering is one of the ones that uh, receives a lot of press, but there's, uh, it does suffer from the challenges of low concentration. So the costs currently are in the hundreds of hundreds of dollars per uh, metric ton of CO2 captured versus the 30 or 60. Um, but we, need all, we do need all the technologies. We need negative emissions technologies that can include direct air capture, and that's, I, I look for a breakthrough and would love a breakthrough in, in uh, low concentration, uh, passive direct air capture. Um, but then when we, oh, that was me making the, the, <laughs> the buzzing noise. Uh, so uh, we need that. We also need uh, technologies for reforestation. Um, and, and allowing at, at the gigaton scale that we need for carbon capture globally, uh, one of the biggest areas is in, in biomass growth, either forestation or even agriculture. 
I think there, there's a tremendous portfolio that we need to be able to deploy very quickly over the, over the next small number of decades uh, to, to reverse that trend. John? How much money? I'm listening to How much money? How much money for what? <laughs> Is the Department of Energy spending on research on direct air capture? Is it greater than zero? How much money is the Department of Energy spending on direct air capture? It is greater than zero. On research, yeah, yeah. On, on direct air capture research. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but it is less, th at, at this point in this fiscal year, less than $20 million a year. You think it's 20 million less? I mean, I think the well, it is not zero, but it is way too small. <laughs> under, <laughs> under my um, uh, laboratory and, and my direction, it is not zero. We are, we are spending um, two and a half million. Yeah. So you mentioned, I'd like to get some details on the cost. You mentioned it costs around $50, you know, give or take a pack or two. Uh, can you tell us what's included in that? And you also mentioned we need to keep the, the gas sequestered for 10,000 years. Could you talk about how that's covering the cost? Yeah. The, the question was, I mentioned some cost numbers, what's included in that, uh, and then how does that increase when, when you consider permanent? Uh, and so the, the cost numbers I, I was giving, and, and my apologies for not giving all the assumptions in that, are specifically just for the capture system uh, and its integration within the plant. It did not include compression, distribution, and sequestration. However, uh, you know, some of our numbers, it's, it's about 63% of the total cost uh, is included in that capture piece, and, and some processes, it's it's as high as 75% of the, of the cost, depending on the distance you have to move the CO2, things like that. Um, if you look at, there's a recent report by the National Petroleum Council, which is one of the FACAs, one of the federal advisory councils for the Secretary of Energy. The National Petroleum Council just released a report uh, on, the, on the cost of carbon capture today, and then really a great analysis on the supply chain of how you start building out uh, capture at different costs, at different different distances from sequestration points and things like that. And they are on the, you know, the $80 per ton, all inclusive, uh, that compares directly to my, uh, the $40 million. I mean, it is sometimes a factor of two, but but it, it widely depends on a specific case scenario. Uh, and so I think we're gonna see a lot more, uh, a lot more granular information on specific scenarios when uh, folks are starting to apply for 40, 45Q. Uh, if they're publicly traded, we'll see them in their, in their disclosures uh, about the full integrated cost uh, that they're realizing. Uh, so we'll have a lot more good information there. Question over here? I also have a, you go and then. I also have a how much, uh, how much money question. Could you compare um, the the money that DOE is putting into uh, grid-scale storage and CCS, and how you think that change in the coming decade or two? Yeah, yeah so the right. question, how, what, what about the funding currently in the department in grid-scale storage and, and CCUS? And so we're, we're at about, for, for CCUS and carbon capture, it's about 100 million, carbon sequestration is about 100 million. So 200 million a year in CCUS um, that, that, that we're spending in the department. Uh, for grid-scale storage, um, I actually don't know that, uh, that number, but I think it's less than, than 200 million. I, I'm looking around the room to see if anybody has actually looked at that, looked at that number, but um, that is the current spend rate. However, in, in subsequent years, if you've seen some of the press releases from the department, it, it has been announced that grid scale storage is going to be a department-wide initiative that's being kicked off this year. Um, with, and, and some of it depends on appropriation budgets and, you know, how Congress feels about how that should go. Um, but it is going to be a department-wide initiative with components in fossil energy and components in renewable and nuclear and how we integrate it onto, the, and, onto grid scale and the Office of Electricity. Um, but I wish I could give you a better number today. 
So we're, we're running over time. Let's do the one last question. Yeah, so the question was, you know, what about the potential for induced seismicity uh, with CO2 sequestration, what research is going on, and how we mitigate that risk? And that is one effort that, that has been cross-cutting, uh, not, uh, not just for CO2 sequestration, uh, but in unconventional hydrocarbon development and in geothermal. And so Lawrence Berkeley National Lab did a lot of work on uh, uh, the reduction of the risk of induced seismicity. Uh, the National Academies have, have done a lot of work, in, uh, particularly around unconventional hydrocarbon and reducing the risk of seismicity. Uh, you can go to Oklahoma and find out a lot about induced seismicity for injection of CO2, or injection, <laughs> excuse me, injection of water. Um, and so uh, as part of our portfolio, there's been a significant effort, particularly under the National Risk Assessment Partnership that we have with those national labs I mentioned, Pacific Northwest and, and Berkeley and Livermore, uh, and focused on how we can assess uh, the, uh, the risk of induced seismicity for CO2 injection. Now there is, one, um, there is one thing that CO2 has going, is it's a compressible fluid. Um, and so when we look at in, inject, injectivity, being able to assess the, the pressure differentials that you're creating in the subsurface, the fact that CO2 is in fact a compressible fluid where the other ones I mentioned uh, were all incompressible fluids, water, uh, does in fact inherently reduce the risk. However, we have a, a significant effort then on as you displace water, displace the brine that's in the subsurface, how you do active pressure management. So we have a project called BEST. It's brine, uh, brine energy storage technology of uh, when you're injecting CO2, how you then manage the pressure uh, by removing the, the water uh, that is seeing the incompressible fluid that's seeing, seeing the pressure increases and doing active reservoir management that way. And so it's, there's, uh, there, there will be um, a need for a similar protocol. There's an induced seismicity protocol in the geothermal space, the, the one I was referring to uh, with Lawrence Berkeley, uh, that, that will need to be assessed uh, uh, with the risk of uh, large-scale injections of CO2. So there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of effort there. Let's thank Brian once more. <laughs>